Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Mastermind Minutes. My name is Gary Oki Grosso. I am the managing partner of Franchise Growth Solutions, and you can learn all about Franchise Growth Solutions and what we do by hitting the link below uh, this podcast platform and, uh, and learn about Franchise Growth Solutions. Mastermind Minutes, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, is a very simple concept. It's one guest, one question, one expert answer. We do it in minutes, not hours, and uh, we realize some of you may want more information, and that's great, so that at the end of the program, we will give you the contact information for our guest, and you can feel free to reach out uh, at your convenience to learn more about what they do and how it might be a great fit for you. Today, my guest is Scott Greenberg, and Scott designs game-changing steps to grow franchises, uh, build high-performing teams, and create unforgettable customer experiences. For 10 years, Scott was a multi-unit award-winning franchisee of Edible Arrangements. We all know Edible Arrangements. Uh, but today, he's a sought-after speaker and business influencer, having presented to McDonald's, Great Clips, uh, Anytime franchise, Anytime Fitness, rather, uh, Remax, I'm trying to think, uh, Wyndham Hotel, Smoothie King, countless others. I'll let him talk about it. He's uh, also a contributing writer for Entrepreneur.com and Global Franchise Magazine and the author of the book, The Wealthy Franchisee, Game-Changing Steps to Becoming a Thriving Franchise Superstar. And that's kind of where I want to start. But Scott, before we get into the question, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing yourself and then about the book, because the book is is... Fantastic. Thanks, Gary. So what I'm interested in is helping franchisors close the franchisee performance gap and then helping franchisees grow their businesses. That's the primary thing that I do in a few different ways. But I'll quickly tell you my story, what got me here. Long before I got into franchising, I was a straight out professional speaker, motivational speaker, leadership consultant, that kind of thing. I had a overcoming adversity story. And I was in college, I was diagnosed with cancer and I'm fine today, but that led to a first presentation, which led to more and it got bigger and bigger. And suddenly I'm traveling and I'm speaking to different groups, but it always bothered me, especially when I was talking about leadership and peak performance, that a lot of people in my audiences had a lot more real world experience in leadership than I did. So I was looking for some kind of real world experience, maybe a business that I could not only use to make money, but to sort of be my leadership laboratory. And uh, through a number of different uh, ways, I ended up getting to the franchise world, I like the idea of being able to look at uh, lots of operators doing the same thing, but getting different results. It seemed like a great place to have this leadership laboratory. So it ended up being edible arrangements. Um, I bought uh, my first location. I built it from the ground up. I mean, ran it for a number of years, but always with this question of what does it take to make it successful? And so for me, getting that information, the ideas was as important as making the money always paying attention to my fellow franchisees. So we quickly learned that after some struggles, but we figured that out. And then we bought a struggling location, one of the worst in the state, and we turned it around and made it profitable really quick. I started getting invitations to speak to other franchise systems, their franchisees about what are these specific things that top franchisees do that enable them to succeed. And part of my process with every franchise brand is to interview many of their franchisees before I go on stage, just to learn about the brand and see what's on their minds. And after doing this for so many years, I've noticed some trends. I hear the same concerns and complaints, but among their top franchisees, who I call wealthy franchisees, I've noticed some common denominators and it might be different than what most people think. So after doing this for so long, I wrote the book, which really discusses these top franchisees, wealthy franchisees, and what makes them different from everyone else. Mm -hmm. So my edible arrangement stores did very well. I finally sold them about five years ago, did very well in the back end. And now I'm full time uh, going back to speaking and coaching and consulting and helping franchisees embrace the same mindset and the same tactics as top people so that they can get the same results. Well, that's that's fantastic, because I think when people go into a franchise business uh, and I'll for my own self. I opened up a Dunkin' Donut shop when I was 24, 25, actually. Uh, but I think when when folks go into a franchise business, they're of the belief that it's all just going to happen. It's just going to magically appear. And I remember learning in that business when they would publish the results, they would rank the stores in my district. I was in New York, in Queens, New York, to be exact. Um, they wouldn't publish the actual sales, but they would publish the rankings, who was in first, who was in second, third, fourth, that sort of stuff. And I became friendly with some of the franchisees who were always ranking in the top, the top three, let's say, of the, of the 20 or 21 units that were in the district. 
And uh, you're right, they had a common thread. There was a thread that ran through uh, each of them. And I was blessed enough to learn it uh, early on because we started, myself and my partner started putting into practice things like, first of all, you know, the guest satisfaction, uh, really focusing on that, focusing on employee satisfaction, uh, having the right attitude to build the business, understanding, as Michael Gerber says, the difference between the business and the work of the business. Um, very often franchisees uh, focus only on the work of the business and they lose sight of, you know, what the actual business is. So why don't we, why don't we start there um, and talk a little bit about why, uh, and this, you know, this may take hours to answer, but you can give us the headlines, but why do top franchisees outperform their peers? You know, they're running essentially the same system they're selling the same product under the same brand name. Let's assume locations are equal, but yet one unit does really well and another one doesn't. What, what, are, those, what are those commonalities there? It's probably the most important question that anybody in franchising can ask, right? What really, and there's a lot of myths, what really are the top people doing and can those things be rel replicated? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes that a franchisee can replicate what top franchisees do and how franchisees think these top people and get the same results. But first we have to understand the three things that impact everyone's performance, regardless of what kind of franchisee you are. Uh, there's three factors. The first is everything circumstantial. That's the economy, it's the competition, it's the pandemic, things we don't control. We love to blame them, but they're really out of our control. So the second thing that impacts our performance would be our operations. That's all the work that we do. It's the system that our franchisor teaches us. So it's your sales and your marketing, your product line, and it's your specific ways of doing things, all the proprietary methods and ingredients and formulas of the corporate office. That's what people are paying for. Now, obviously that's incredibly important, but again, you can go in the same franchise system where everyone's doing the same work, doing the same things in the same circumstances, but they're getting different results. And the reason for that is, and this really is the differentiator, is the human factor. What each franchisee brings to their own business. So that's gonna include their mindset, their ability to keep their emotions in control. It's their ability to build trust with the franchisor and keep their thoughts in check and not get suspicious too early. It's their ability to really engage and inspire employees and to create meaningful experiences that their customers remember. It's all that human stuff that the franchisor can't control. They can give you a, a manual but franchisees are gonna execute the same operations differently based on that human factor. And unlike our circumstances, the human factor is something we completely control. So what I try to help franchisees understand is if they can master the human factor in addition to really great operations, that's when you're gonna maximize your chance of getting great results. So that's really what wealthy franchisees do. They have a baseline of great operations but then they infuse it with these human factors because they understand that marketing is not just about advertising, it's about patience and faith. And managing employees isn't just about directing their work, it's about developing them and making them leaders. And customer service isn't just about facilitating transactions, it's about building connections and elevating the emotional state of your customers so that they were, you, know, you make an impression, they remember you and talk about you and want to come back. These human factors are the huge difference maker and that's, that's what I talk about. Well, I, I think that's that's brilliant because it, it is the human factor. Uh, you know, when my partner and I develop a franchise brand, um, sometimes the franchisor will ask us, you know, what should they look for in a franchisee? And we, you know, we often talk about qualities. They they believe we're going to be talking about that the person may have restaurant experience or that skill set or this skill set. And we remind them that it's their job as the franchisor to kind of download the skill set to the franchisee, that if they've de developed their system properly, uh, anyone with the right qualities and reasonable intelligence should be able to execute the system. But the part that we see franchisors not focus on very often is, as you mentioned, the, the human element. What are those qualities? What are those things that really determine the difference between the top performer and the mediocre performer? Um, what do you believe, and I have, my own, I, have, I have my own opinion on this, but what do you believe the franchisor, franchisor's role should be in 
supporting franchisees in these, you know, in these human elements. And I guess for the lack of a better word, teaching them how to really exploit that level of thinking. Um, you know, there's what the franchise role should be and there's what it could be. What it should be is consistent with whatever is in the franchise agreement. It would be awesome if they were as focused on developing the franchisee's mindset as much as developing their skill set. But the reality is for most franchisors, these human factors, it's not even in their skill set. They're experts in frozen yogurt and pest control and in-home senior care. And that's a lot to be able to really develop those systems and then learn how to replicate them and then recruit franchisees and teach them. That's a whole lot. They're not psychologists. They're not life coaches. They're not people who've necessarily devoted a lot of their lives to understanding those things. So for a lot, they don't recognize how important it is. It's not a priority. They'd rather focus on operations, on the business stuff, um, or they just may not be aware. It just may not be in their skill set. So what I tell franchisees is if you have to choose between two brands and one has really great operations but doesn't provide much emotional support, or you can find a brand that really provides the emotional support but their systems are so-so, go with the brand that has the great systems because you can get the human factor, the emotional support in other places. Now, really great brands that really understand the importance of culture, that really understand this human factor, they won't put in a franchise agreement, but it is part of what they do. Whether it's um, you know, having you know, mastermind meetings and you know, peer groups, that kind of thing, where franchisees are supporting each other, or whether it's training field support in um, you know, understanding the, the psychological aspects of it. Some brands do more than this. And you know, the brands that I work with, they bring me in because they see that it's a priority. So, I'm naturally, you know, working with the brands that already kind of have that value, but most themselves don't. So I don't think there's an obligation to, but I think there's an opportunity for franchisors to provide more support there, especially because when you ask them, you know, why franchisees are struggling, usually it's not because of what they know. It's more about what they're thinking and what they're feeling. So it's a problem for the franchisors who are trying to elevate franchisee performance, but it's not just where they focus. So it's not an obligation on their part, but I think it's an opportunity. So, and I couldn't agree with you more. And it, 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 it's it's such an abstract topic in the sense that people who are not necessarily entrepreneurial minded who gravitate towards franchising, and I always make the distinction that um, the best franchisees are not necessarily entrepreneurs per se, because they're going to want to reinvent the wheel, and the idea is to execute. So are there some nuts and bolts? So if, if I've got the right attitude, okay, I've got the right attitude, I'm being coached, I understand I have the right mindset. How does that translate into, say, some nuts and bolts, actionable things that top performing franchisees do um, that, again, the average franchisee doesn't do? Okay. So first of all, understanding that having the right mindset, that's not a place you get to, that's ongoing maintenance just like so many other parts of business. And so part of it is, and it's so much more than just attitude, it's ability to connect with people and, uh, and to constantly reflect on oneself, to constantly get yourself back to your point of clarity, where you just have, you're not positive or negative, where you're clear. That's where the best business decisions are made. And so that requires ongoing work to do that. So that's, that's one thing is to constantly reflect and look in the mirror as much as you look at your p &L or or anything else. Um, but then I think it's also important to then translate that to the workplace and create operational elements that tie into that, whether it is a daily stand up meeting with your employees who are checking in with them, reminding them of you know, what the mission is, understanding what their mindset is and constantly trying to support them. I think there's a lot of ways in which uh, we need to kind of focus on that. But operationally, one thing that I noticed that all these wealthy franchisees have in common, it's really three things, actually. And in fact, I'm going to spoil the book for everyone. I have, you know, 80, I think the book is like 82,000 words, but in just a few words, in the very end of the book, what I say is if you have to boil it down to the three things that wealthy franchisees do, they keep a clear head, which is what I was just talking about. They um, stick to the proven system and they use their business to improve the lives of everyone it touches. So let's go back to sticking to the system. What I noticed about these top franchisees, and I interviewed a number of them and I profile one in each chapter of the book, they're not particularly creative or innovative. And if they are, they don't really bring that into their business too much. They outsource that. They paid for someone else to take care of those things. They're masters at execution. 
They occasionally have ideas, but they talk about it with the franchisor to see if it's something that's appropriate to do globally for the entire system. But these people, they really just stick to the system and they execute. And that helps them have a better partnership with the franchisor. None of these people say, the reason I got successful in franchising is because I did things my own way. Some of them had higher standards. I talked to um, one fr multi-unit franchisee from Great Clips. He has scores of locations. He doesn't deviate from their standards, but he has higher standards. So, you know, if they, if, um, if uh, Great, Great Clips wants to limit the wait time, he wants that wait time to be even shorter. So he's not really deviating, but he might be even raising the standards, but that's it. They stick to the system. That's a huge thing. They bought in to mitigate risk. If they deviate from the system, they're exposing themselves to the same risk they were trying to mitigate. So they really stick to the system. But then there's this third piece. So they keep a clear head, they stick to the system. They use their business to improve the lives of everyone else that touches. So when they jump out of bed in the morning, they're not thinking, how can I make more money? They're thinking, how can I make a difference? Put value out in 360 directions. How can I improve the lives of my vendors? How can I improve the lives of my employees, of my customers, of my community? They understand there's a boomerang effect. And their business is an opportunity to engage everyone around them. So they want to do that in a way that just helps other people, that improves their lives through their products, through their services, through their solutions, and just through their connection to them. And by providing value like that, letting that be the philosophy that drives them, it naturally leads to practices that grows their business. So what I tell people is if you want to make a difference in the world, then think about how you can improve other lives. But if you don't care about making a difference, if you just want to make money, still the best way to do it is to improve the lives of everyone else. So those are really the three things that they do. They keep a clear head, they stick to the proven system, and they use their business to improve the lives of everyone else. Well, I, I, I love it, and I, especially the third, because I think that should be the mission uh, that folks create when they create their business, whether it's uh, buying into a franchise or starting a business. Scott, um, any last thought that you want to share with potential franchisees or franchisors that are listening? And then we'll talk about how people can get the book and get in touch with you. Sure. I guess it's this. You know, as you said before, a lot of people go into franchising thinking it's one thing and it becomes something else. I took my son on a fishing boat once and the deckhand handed my young son a fishing rod knowing there was a fish on the line. So all my son had to do was reel it in. Hey, he caught a fish. I think a lot of people get into franchising thinking that's how it's going to be. I'll pay the franchise fee, sign the contract, and I'm going to be given a business that's just automatically going to generate money. And they don't really understand what it is that they bring to it, that human factor. And so I think there needs to be more discussion of that, that franchisees need to reflect a lot more on this human factor and understand that is not a, hot, a soft skill. These are critical skills that give hard results. And so I think franchisees need to be aware of that. I think franchisors can and should support that. And if they do and acknowledge that we're human beings doing the best we can, um, I think we're going to have a better experience running our businesses. That's, that is excellent i mean it's brilliant advice really it, it's that's that's terrific I, I love to hear that sort of advice because i think it really takes the the uh, the result and puts the control of getting to that within ourselves as opposed to placing it in the hands of others and i think that's what we need to really embrace and understand as we as we build businesses and really go through our lives um the book um i'm assuming and I've read parts of it. A lot of this is in the book. How do we get it? Is it on Amazon? How, how do folks get the book? Yeah, so the book is available anywhere our books are sold. Amazon is the most obvious choice. There is also an audio book. I had to audition to narrate my own audio book, just so you know. <laughs> um, but uh, fortunately, I do a pretty good impression of myself. But yeah, so it is my voice, but I had to audition to, to get that work. So uh, there's an audio book, there's an ebook. So yeah, wherever books are sold, uh, you can get that. Uh, I want to mention too that I've had a lot of franchisees contact me after reading a book wanting to go even deeper. So I've created a 14-week uh, online program called the Wealthy Franchisee Business Breakthrough Program, which not only gives franchisees sort of the instructions they need, but takes them through exercises, but it guides them through action they can take immediately so they can move forward fast and grow their business right away. So if anyone wants information on that, and really wants to take their business to the next level and sort of be part of a community of high-level franchisees, go to thewealthyfranchisee.com. That's, that's great. Actually, that sounds like something I'd like to put in front of my franchise or clients that they can share with their franchise community. Because uh, listen, 
everyone everyone needs help and assistance and coaching you know as i tell people all the time you know people like muhammad ali and and michael jordan you know top in their they had coaches and yeah, they, you're you're right they, they didn't do it alone in fact gary i'll tell you just last week i actually um got a contract with a, uh, a franchisor that's growing really fast they are actually going to provide this course to all new franchisees as part of their onboarding process because they know that the skill set is not enough. They want to set them up the right mindset to help them build their culture. So mm -hmm. this program is now just part of their onboarding process. So uh, they, they would agree with you. And they're using that as a promotional tool to recruit more franchisees so that franchise aspiring franchisees understand the kind of support they're going to get. So really excited to be part of that. Yeah, well, I think I think that's brilliant because at the end of the day, it uh, it will help. Uh, with the three factors and then the sidebar factor of, you know, making money, uh, not only for the franchise or, but for the franchisee, if someone wants to get in touch with you directly is, do you have a website that's a different web address than you gave earlier? How can people reach you? Yeah. Just go to scottgreenberg.com. All my contact information is there as well as all my social media. Um, and if anybody's interested in, you know, learning more about my background or my speaking programs or any of that stuff, uh, it's scottgreenberg.com. Great, great. Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing your thoughts and your insights and your wisdom with us today. I'm sure my audience enjoyed it. Um, I hope to speak with you again soon. I'll, I'll be in touch certainly about the program to see if my clients are, are interested in it. I can't see why they wouldn't be. And uh, again, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thanks, Gary. Really enjoyed it.